Studio Ghibli is a staple of anime. They have produced some of the best and most recognizable anime movies of all time. And because of this, many people are arguing over what their best work is. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be getting myself cancelled, I mean, prove to you all that I have the best taste on all of Anytube by ranking all of Studio Ghibli's movies, at least the ones I've seen, from worst to best. So let's just get to it. Coming up in last place, we have what is clearly the worst Studio Ghibli movie, because I say so. And that is the 2010 movie Karigura Shino Arietti, otherwise known as The Secret World of Arietti. This one and a half hour fantasy movie is based on the 1952 novel The Borrowers by Mary Norton, and it was directed by Hiromasa Yonobayashi. In this story we follow the sickly Sho who is spending the summer at his aunt's house. While there he discovers something amazing, miniature people about the size of his finger. Sho ends up calling them borrowers due to them living off tiny bits of human possessions. One of these borrowers is the titular Arietti, who lives with her parents in the basement. Sho and Arietti try to become friends, despite the warnings of Arietti's parents. However, Sho fails to realize the adversities the borrowers face on a daily basis. Not only do they have to try to keep themselves hidden, but they also have to embark on perilous adventures into human territory, both indoors and outdoors. So yeah, this movie is in my opinion the weakest that Ghibli has created. While it is by no means an awful movie, the pacing, story, and overall feel of it just doesn't do enough to grab my interest. And as nice as the idea of two different kinds of humans getting together and showing that their differences don't really matter, it just doesn't explore that in a satisfying way. So that's why it ends up here at the very bottom. Up next we've got the second worst Ghibli movie of all time, and that is the 2002 movie Neko no Onegaeshi, or The Cat Returns. This is a spin-off of another Ghibli movie that will also make an appearance on this list at a later point. Stay tuned to find out which. This movie is also only the second Ghibli movie to have been directed by someone other than Hayao Miyazaki or Isao Takahata, as it was directed by Hiroyuki Morita. In The Cat Returns we follow high school student Haru Yoshioka, who is bored with the monotony of life. However one day she ends up saving a cat from being run over by a truck. But that cat is not just any cat, it's Prince Luna of the Cat Kingdom. As a token of his gratitude, the Cat King sends Haru presents and invites her to the Cat Kingdom so that she can become Luna's wife. And due to Haru's inability to properly communicate with the cats, a misunderstanding arises as they think she has accepted a proposal. As Haru ponders how to get out of this predicament, a mysterious voice tells her to go to the Cat Bureau, where she meets Baron Humbert von Gickingen, who owns the Cat Bureau. However, she is quickly swarmed by a bunch of cats who take her to the Cat Kingdom, and Baron Humbert follows closely behind. While Haru is there, she immerses herself in their activities, but as time progresses, she finds herself becoming more and more cat-like. And unless she can find her true self, she may become a cat permanently. Now, I know what you're thinking, since I'm putting this movie all the way down here. This guy's a dog person, isn't he? But no, alas, I actually prefer cats. But just because this movie has cats in it, it sadly isn't enough to convince me that it deserves to be higher on the list. The story is just not that interesting, and all things considered, the whole thing is just very predictable. Not a very engaging watch in my opinion. As this list progresses, we are starting to move into more and more acceptable quality of movies. And so coming in at number 16 we have the 2004 movie Howl's Moving Castle. This movie is loosely based on the English 1986 novel of the same name, written by Diana Wynne Jones. Howl's Moving Castle tells the story of Sophie Hatter, the plain daughter of a hat maker, who expects very little from her future. As long as she has a job and can work hard in the shop, she is content. One day she runs into Howl, an infamous wizard known both for his magical prowess, but also for his womanizing ways. And when she returns home she is greeted by the Witch of the Waste, who turns her into a 90 plus year old woman. Now she has to find a way to return to normal, together with a myriad of eccentric companions, like Howl, a powerful fire demon, and a hopping scarecrow. Now, Howl is honestly fairly interesting. The setting of this movie mixes magic and 20th century technology, as well as war that makes for quite the interesting backdrop to the events of this movie. Sadly, the main plot doesn't grab me anywhere near as much as the backdrop does, so because of that it ends up all the way down here in 16th place. Alright, coming up in 15th we have the amazing 30 minute OVA from 2007 known as Iblar Khan. This amazing and calming short movie is just a piece of art, and quite frankly, I think I'm being too harsh putting it down here. What? What do you mean it doesn't count? It was just an art showcase? 
Fine. Okay, so coming up in 16th, we have Gake no Ue no Ponyo, or just Ponyo. This 2008 movie was directed by Hayao Miyazaki and was his 8th animated film with Studio Ghibli. The story goes something like this. One day, a goldfish sneaks away from home and ends up getting stuck in a glass jar. She drifts to the shore where she is saved by the 5 year old Sosuke and he names her Ponyo. Sosuke ends up cutting himself while freeing Ponyo from the jar, but to his surprise, she heals his cut. This is because this isn't just a normal goldfish. Her name is Brunhilde, and she is the daughter of the wizard Fujimoto, who forsook his humanity to live underwater. Fearing that his daughter has been kidnapped, Fujimoto sends out his wave spirit to recover her, but Ponyo rejects her birth name and declares she wants to become a human, and using the power she received due to being the daughter of a wizard, she grows arms and legs and escapes to the surface once again. However, the magic released into the ocean creates an imbalance in nature, causing the moon to start falling out of orbit and the tides to grow stronger and more dangerous. And now that she is reunited with Sosuke, him and Ponyo have to pass an ancient test in order to restore the world and to allow Ponyo to live as a human. Oh Ponyo, what can I say about you? Well, I can say that this movie has a lot of ups and downs, which is why it's there in 15th. On one hand, it has some extremely impressive visuals, not exactly unheard of for Ghibli, but apart from that, the movie is just nice. It's about Sosuke and Ponyo who wants to be friends, but they can't be friends because Sosuke is human and Ponyo is a goldfish. But with the power of magic, Ponyo can also become human. Cue some world saving and power of friendship. Nothing amazing, but definitely decently solid. Our 14th best, and or worst Studio Ghibli movie, is the two hour long historical drama directed by Hayao Miyazaki called The Wind Rises. This movie came out in 2013 and is a fictionalized biographical film based on Jiro Horikoshi, who was the designer of the Mitsubishi A5M fighter aircraft and its successor, Mitsubishi A6M Zero, which was used by the Japanese during World War II. This movie tells the story of Jiro Horikoshi, a man whose dreams has always been to become a pilot and fly planes. However, due to his nearsightedness, he is not able to fly planes. So since he can't fly them, he instead decides to leave his hometown to study aeronautical engineering, so that he can design planes, just like his hero, Giovanni Battista Caproni. However, many trials await him, such as the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, where he saves a maid serving the family of Naoko Satomi, as well as the social unrest that leads up to the eventual surrender of Japan during World War II. We follow Jiro's life, as he learns the harshness of war, as well as how his dreams of creating planes is contributing to this war and the losses on both sides. Did you know that Miyazaki loves planes? Like, really loves planes? Of course you do, it's pretty well documented. And that is exactly what makes The Wind Rises such an interesting watch, since this movie is a fictional take on Jiro Horikoshi, who also really likes planes. But his planes were also used as weapons during World War II, which is something that comes up in this movie. All in all, it's a pretty solid film, but it's hard to recommend it as a must watch from Ghibli. Therefore, it ends up all the way down here in 14th place. Up next, we've got Ghibli's 13th best movie, and that is the 1986 film directed by Hayao Miyazaki called Tenku no Shiro Laputa, otherwise known as Castle in the Sky. Laputa is set in a fictional 19th century and follows the adventures of a boy and a girl who are trying to keep a powerful crystal away from the army a group of secret agents, and a family of pirates, while simultaneously searching for a legendary floating castle. We follow Shita, a young girl who has been kidnapped by government agents who seek her mysterious crystal amulet. However, as the airship she is on is raided by pirates, Shita manages to escape in the confusion. She then ends up meeting Posu, a boy who dreams of reaching the fabled flying castle Laputa. Together they decide to embark on a journey to find Laputa, However, the government agents are still hot on their heels, as they are also trying to reach Laputa for their own greedy purposes. You know what else Miyazaki likes that isn't planes? That's right, nature. And Castle in the Sky is one of the movies where Miyazaki really focuses on this. Specifically, it takes a critical look at humanity's relationship with nature and the role of technology. These themes are usually when Miyazaki is at his strongest when it comes to storytelling, in my opinion. That said though, I don't find Castle in the Sky to be one of his stronger works with these themes, but it's still by no means a bad movie, just not a top 10 Ghibli movie. In 12th, we got a movie from 1995 directed by Yoshifumi Kondo. We alluded to this one earlier when we said that The Cat Returns was a spin-off of something, and if you know your Ghibli, you know exactly what movie this is. That's right, it's The Whisper of the Heart. This movie is based on a manga of the same name written by Aoi Hiragi. 
The story of Whisper of the Heart goes something like this. Shisuka Tsukishima is an energetic 14-year-old who enjoys reading and writing poetry. However, one day as she is looking through the checkout cards in her library book, she notices that they are all previously checked out by a boy named Seiji Amasawa. She decides to track down this boy who shares her love for literature. Shisuka ends up following a cat that leads her to a quaint antique shop where she learns about the cat statue known as the Baron. Shisuku is also surprised to find the very boy she was looking for, Seiji, in this shop, and they quickly become friends. Shisuku learns that Seiji dreams of becoming a master luthier. This causes her some dismay, as she is uncertain about her own talents and what her future holds. But as her friendship with Seiji grows, she becomes determined to work towards her own goal, simply guided by the whisper of her heart. So yeah, this is the movie that I was talking about earlier. The better cat movie. Whisper of the Heart is a sweet tale about youth, and about goals and dreams. And of course, it's a movie about John Denver's song Take Me Home Country Roads. Okay, maybe not. But the song is featured, both in English and Japanese. But despite all this, I can't help but feel that this movie is a bit wishy-washy in its delivery. So because of this, it ends up in 12th on my list. In 11th, we've got a movie that I'm sure is going to divide some opinions. That is the 2011 movie directed by Goro Miyazaki called From Up on Poppy Hill. It's based on a manga of the same name from 1980 written by Tetsuro Sayama and illustrated by Chisuru Takahashi. The story of From Up on Poppy Hill is set in Yokohama, Japan in 1963. It tells the story of Umi Matsusaki, a high school girl living in the boarding house Kokelian Manor. One day she meets a boy named Shun Kasama, who is a member of the school's newspaper club. They decide to clean up the school's clubhouse, the Latin Quarter, however the chairman of the local high school intends to demolish the building for redevelopment. And so Umi and Shun, together with Shiro Mizunuma, try to persuade him to reconsider demolishing Kokalian Manor. And as all this is happening, Umi ends up getting closer to Shun, and after learning that he is an orphan who doesn't know much about his past, they begin searching for clues that can tell them more about him and his family. It also turns out that the two may have a lot more in common than they first thought. So yeah, this is probably going to be a bit controversial, putting From Up on Poppy Hill this high and especially above works like Whisper of the Heart. However, it wouldn't be fun to put this list together if I didn't ruffle a few feathers. But yeah, for me this movie was nice and fairly interesting. I still wouldn't consider it a great movie, but it was by no means a bad story. Sadly not enough to enter my top 10 though. Now we're entering the top 10 and we're finally starting to hit the movies that really matter, and you should definitely watch. And the movie that starts this off is the 1988 movie Hotaru no Haka, or Grave of the Fireflies. This movie was directed by Isao Takahara and based on a semi-autobiographical short story from 1967 of the same name, written by Akiyuki Nosaka. Grave of the Fireflies is centered on Nosaka's experiences during and after the American firebombing of Kobe in 1945 during World War II. In the story we follow the two Japanese children Seita and Setsuko, who end up losing their parents and home to the firebombing. We follow them as they try to escape and end up as homeless and having to fend for themselves to try to survive. Seita, who is only 14 years old, has to try to take care of his younger sister Setsuko, who is only 4, and does everything he can to keep them alive, including stealing food. This movie focuses on the effect that the war has on people, and how even the kindest people can turn cruel and cold as the war rages on. Grave of the Fireflies is arguably the best known anime movie about World War II. Because of that, it becomes a lot of people's first look at a story depicting the Japanese side of the events that transpired during the war. What separates Grave of the Fireflies from other anime movies about World War II though, is that Grave of the Fireflies does not really focus on the effects of the atom bomb. For that, I suggest watching Barefoot again. Be warned though, it's pretty gruesome. Anyways, back to Grave of the Fireflies. This movie is quite impactful, and different from a lot of other movies about the topic, it doesn't try to paint everyone as together or helpful. If anything, a lot of people in this movie are simply cold and have enough fending for themselves. But that is what makes this a good watch. It's just an interesting and different kind of war movie. In ninth, we've got a movie about everyone's favorite neighbors. That's right. I'm of course talking about Tonari no Yamada-kun, or My Neighbors the Yamadas. What, were you expecting something else? This one hour and 40 minute movie from 1999 was directed by Isao Takahara and based on a manga called Nono-chan by Hisachi Ishii. This movie is made to be a series of vignettes following the daily lives of the Yamada family. 
Mostly focusing on comedy, this movie takes us through some of the day-to-day -day events of the Yamada family. Like losing your child in a store, family relations, meeting one's first girlfriend, and much more. So to keep things short, My Neighbors the Yamadas is pretty much just straight family comedy. And honestly, it's pretty good at it. It's heartwarming, puts a smile on your face, and it's just an overall good time. What more could you possibly want? Taking the 8th spot on this list is the 2001 movie Sento Chihiro no Kamikakushi, or Spirited Away. This fantasy movie was written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki, and has been a highly successful movie, both critically and financially. Spirited Away has not only won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, but it was also the highest grossing Japanese film in history, a record it held for 19 years before it was overtaken in 2020 by Demon Slayer, Mugen Train. The story of Spirited Away goes something like this. Chihiro Ogino is a 10-year-old girl who is traveling with her parents to their new home. They decide to take a shortcut and end up at an abandoned amusement park. Chihiro's dad insists on exploring this amusement park, but something is strange. Despite it seeming abandoned, it's still stocked with food. Her parents decide to eat the food, while Chihiro decides to keep exploring. She reaches a bathhouse and meets a boy named Haku, who warns her that she must cross back over the riverbed before sunset. However, Chihiro can't do that, because when she returns to get her parents, they have been transformed into pigs. Unbeknownst to Chihiro, she has crossed over into the spirit world, and is now trapped. She must now live and work among the spirits, while trying to find a way to return her parents and get out of the spirit world. Ah, uh, Spirited Away. The Oscar-winning movie by Hayao Miyazaki. Clearly there is no denying that this movie is fantastic. I'm definitely not going to be the one to make that claim anyways. However, it's not really one of my favorite Ghibli movies but I couldn't justify not putting it in the top 10. So here it is, sitting pretty in 8th place. Is that controversial? Probably. The 7th spot on my Ghibli rankings goes to a real classic from 1989, and that is the Hayao Miyazaki directed fantasy movie Majo no Tekyubin, or Kiki's Delivery Service. This movie is based on a 1985 novel of the same name, written by Eiko Kadono. Kiki's Delivery Service tells the story of Kiki, a 13-year-old witch in training who must spend a year living on her own in a distant town in order to become a full-fledged witch. So she and her black cat Gigi settles down in a coastal town named Koriko. Kiki has no place to stay, but a baker called Osono gives her a room, and in exchange, Kiki has to help her deliver her baked goods. She also ends up setting up her own delivery service. Now Kiki also has to deal with an aviation nerd named Tombo, who is very interested in her ability to fly using a broomstick. And while she spends her days in Koriko, she has a lot of new and exciting experiences, and learns the true meaning of responsibility. If there is one thing that I'm a big fan of, it's coming of age stories, and Iyashike, and Kiki's firmly falls into this category. Now, I know a lot of people would argue this is one of Ghibli's best ever movies, however I'm not most people. It is definitely a fantastic film, however I have one gripe with it that makes it fall all the way to 7th, and that is Kiki. Now, she definitely feels like a realistic young woman, so I've got no complaints in that regard. However, she's also a bit annoying in that her mood swings pretty quickly, and that can sometimes be a little annoying. So 7th it is. In 6th, we've got a movie from 1992 directed by Hayao Miyazaki. That is Kurenai no Buta, otherwise known as Porco Rosso. This movie is based on a three-part watercolor manga called Hikote Jidai, or The Age of the Flying Boat, also by Hayao Miyazaki. The plot of this movie revolves around the Italian World War I ex-fighter pilot ace, Marco Pago, who now makes a living as a freelance bounty hunter chasing air pirates in the Adriatic Sea. Due to an unusual curse, Marco is transformed into an anthropomorphic pig, and is now instead referred to as Porco Rosso, which is Italian for red pig or red pork. One day, while he is traveling to fix his faulty engine, he gets shot down by a young American hotshot named Donald Curtis. Excited by the possibility of fame, Donald proudly proclaims that the flying pig is now dead. But Porco Rosso isn't just going to take this defeat. He flees the Piccolo SPA airplane company to get his plane fixed. There he meets the 17-year-old chief engineer Fio Piccolo, who is hungry to prove her talent. So with Fio's improvements, Porco Rosso prepares to challenge Donald Curtis officially and regain his lost honor. Porco Rosso is a movie that I honestly wasn't expecting to like that much. However, it pleasantly surprised me. As you can clearly tell, I put it at 6th after all. And one of the reasons why this movie is so interesting to me is because it's the first time I've ever felt I could understand Miyazaki's love for planes. One of the reasons for this is the character Fio. 
Seeing someone so passionate about her work on fixing and improving airplanes, as well as how much she wants to help Marco get back at Donald, made me feel like I could relate at least a little bit to Miyazaki's passion for planes. That, as well as Marco's past as a World War I fighter pilot, makes this movie a really enjoyable watch. So sixth it is. Now we are entering the top five, as well as what in my opinion is the best of the best Studio Ghibli has to offer. And kicking us off is the 1997 movie written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki called Mononoke Hime or Princess Mononoke. Princess Mononoke was both a critical and commercial hit, and held the record for highest grossing film in Japan of 1997, and held Japan's box office record for domestic films until 2001 Spirited Away, which we've already talked about earlier in this list. Princess Mononoke is set in the late Muromachi period of Japan, which is approximately 1336 to 1573 CE, though it contains a lot of fantasy elements. We follow a young Emishi prince named Ashtaka, who gets involved in a struggle between the gods of the forest and the humans who consume his resources. Princess Mononoke is a movie with a very clear message. The environment. More specifically, humanity's struggle with advancement and growth against nature's need for preservation. And the way this movie handles this topic is very interesting. This is for sure a must-watch movie from Ghibli, and one of the very best movies Hayao Miyazaki has ever directed easily deserving of a top 5 spot on this list. The fourth spot I'm going to be giving to a movie from 2014 that was directed by Hiromasa Yonobayashi, and the name of this movie is Omoide no Marini, or When Marnie Was There. This psychological drama is based on Joanne G. Robinson's 1967 novel of the same name. The movie tells us the story of the 12-year-old girl Anna Sasaki. She is suffering from asthma and is also very unsociable and isolated from others. Worried about this, Anna's foster parents sends her to the countryside on recommendation from the doctor, in the hopes that the clean air and relaxed environment is gonna do her good. So she travels to the Kushiro wetlands of Hokkaido, where she stays with some relatives. One day, Anna comes across an abandoned mansion where she meets a mysterious girl named Marnie. She asks Anna to keep her existence a secret from everyone else, and over the course of the summer, Anna and Marnie spend a lot of time together and learn more about her family and foster care. Despite being the most recent Ghibli movie on this list, this was actually the first Ghibli movie I watched. I'm someone who really likes psychological shows, and that is exactly what this movie promised. And in all honesty, I think it delivers quite well on that. Seeing Anna having to deal with her loneliness is definitely something that hits home with me, being that I had to spend an entire year in a place away from my family and where I didn't know anyone. It definitely makes me relate to Anna in some ways. And the other interesting aspect of the movie is what we learn about Marnie's family, which leads into the twist of this movie, which I'm obviously not going to spoil here. But all in all, it's a pretty good movie. And what a comeback from Yodobayashi, huh? With Arietti in last and Marnie in fourth. Coming in at the third spot on our Ghibli rankings is a movie about another princess. This time we're talking about the 2013 movie Kaguya Hime no Monogatari, or The Tale of Princess Kaguya. This movie is directed by Isao Takahata and is based on The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter, a 10th century Japanese folktale. The story of Princess Kaguya revolves around a girl they call, well, Princess Kaguya. A bamboo cutter one day discovers a small girl inside a bamboo shoot. Believing her to be a divine presence, the bamboo cutter and his wife decide to raise her as their own child. She grows up rapidly, making the other village children nickname her Takenoko, or Little Bamboo. One day the bamboo cutter finds a large fortune of gold and treasure in the forest. Believing this to be yet another gift from the heavens, moving him and his family to a mansion in the capital. Kaguya leaves her friends behind for an unwanted life of royalty, but in turn discovers her origins and purpose. If there is one thing I can say to praise Takahata, it's how good he is at portraying characters' feelings and emotions. And that especially holds true in this alternative telling of the tale of the bamboo cutter. Princess Kaguya really wants the viewer to understand how Kaguya feels about the whole situation. Being forced into the life of royalty, having to leave all her friends behind and all of that stuff. It's a very powerful movie, and is arguably one of Takahata's best ever works. However, there is still one of his other movies that tops this one. Now we've reached the second best Ghibli movie according to me. And honestly, this is in my opinion a very underrated movie. At least nowadays. Probably because it's a lot less fantastical than a lot of other Ghibli movies, and more adult focused as well. I'm of course talking about the 1991 movie directed by Isao Takahara called Omoide Poro Poro, or Only Yesterday. This movie was based on the 1982 manga of the same name by Hotaru Okamoto and Yuko Tone. The story is primarily set in 1982 and tells the story of Taeko Okajima, 
A 27-year-old unmarried office lady who has lived her whole life in Tokyo. She decides to visit some family in the countryside to unwind from her normal everyday life. She takes the sleeper train to Yamagata and starts to recall memories of her childhood back in 1966, as well as her wishes and goals she had as a child. Once she arrives in Yamagata, she ends up running into Toshio, her brother-in-law's second cousin, who picks her up. While she spends time in the countryside, she finds herself increasingly nostalgic and wistful for her childhood self, while also dealing with issues like career and love. So like I said, I think this movie is a bit underrated, at least nowadays. It was quite successful when it was released, even becoming the highest grossing Japanese movie at the box office in Japan in the year of its release. But it's rare that I will see people really give this movie the credit it deserves. However, I love this movie. A lot. It makes me reflect on my own life and where I'm heading. It's definitely a movie better suited to an adult audience, but it's for sure one of the best Ghibli movies ever made. And in my opinion, this is the movie that best showcases Takahata's ability to convey characters' feelings, uncertainty, and emotions better than any of his other works. Now we have come to the final movie on this list, and the inarguably best movie that Ghibli has ever produced. I'm of course talking about the 1988 movie about our favorite neighbor, Tonari no Totoro, or My Neighbor Totoro. This movie was directed by Hayao Miyazaki. The story of Totoro is set in the countryside of 1950s Japan. Professor Tatsuo Kusakabe relocates himself and his two daughters, Satsuki and Mei, to the countryside, so that they can be closer to their mother, who was hospitalized due to a long-term illness. We see the girls adapt to rural life, and also get acquainted with the friendly wood spirits that inhabit this place. Particularly the big hairy goofball Totoro, who Mei and Satsuki befriends. Soon the young girls find their lives filled with magical adventures in nature and fantastical creatures. So yeah. As far as I'm concerned, Totoro is peak Ghibli. There are few movies, Ghibli or otherwise, who do a better job at depicting the cute and innocent, while also showing such a clear love for the countryside and nature itself. Yes, the movie is a bit childish, but it's literally made for children. But despite me being nothing more than a man-child at best, I still find myself totally enamored with this movie. It's cute and fun in a way that I think most people will at least find some enjoyment from. So yeah. This is my 100% objective, not at all biased rankings of Studio Ghibli's movies. Arguably the best list you can find out there. However, if you for some reason disagree with this, or feel like you can do better, then go ahead and prove it by showing your own list in the comments. I dare you. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or join my Discord, you can find links to both of those in the description. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more anime-related videos from me. Peace.